Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. Sorry that I have to speak in English. Um, thank you for being here. I just wanted to thank Gladi Mates for giving me this opportunity. Um, first and foremost, I just want to thank the Bitcoin community, a group of volunteers that you know spared their own time to allow this technology to progress to get to the point where corporations and other entities are able to use it. And we must never forget that this was a technology that was created by free people, free-minded individuals that didn't take into account the, hours, the thousands of hours they put towards this technology to get it to where it is. Um, apart from that, let's begin. My name is Amin. I've worked in the Bitcoin field since 2013, various projects I've been involved with. I worked as a journalist, I worked as a designer, I worked with communities to develop this. Various examples of how this uh, technology can be applied in various fields apart from the financial application, which most people are concerned with. And there I found myself kind of contemplating where to move forward myself. And I guess Bit Nation is what resonated with my philosophical understanding of life and how people should live and individuality as well as, as, well as collective um, organizational people on the blockchain. So moving forward, I just want to give out some examples of how uh, in the past technologies have been downplayed by key members in society. So that's the IBM chairman in 1943 saying, you know, there's a world market for maybe five computers. And we know that today in every pocket in, in this room of every person, there is at least a small computer. Thereafter, I want to just quickly show you a clip from Warren Buffett. And I hope the audio works. If it doesn't work, I'll skip it. <coughs> no, that's okay. But <coughs> sorry about that. Yeah, the audio didn't really work. But pretty much, um, he refers to Bitcoin as a mirage, that it's never going to go anywhere. Um, it's a technology that is very similar to Czech, as he refers to it. And we know today that such things were far from the truth. And for me, it's kind of painful to see these key members in society have control over the financial institutions and things like that, that, I can, that can actually allow a change to come about, limit this change. I mean, if this technology was brought about by a patent, by JP Morgan or such, it would have been in every corner of the planet. But unfortunately, that's not the case, and people like myself have to go out and teach people what it really is capable of. So innovation pathways, you know, what can we refer to? The seatbelt was created, and nine years later, it was adopted and made law. So nine years, um, on average in the US, 11,000 people per year are saved by the seatbelt. That's 99,000 people during the time that they had to decide whether we should make this law that could have been um, saved by the seatbelt. And this example puts into stone kind of a, a explicit idea that, you know, ideas exist and if we wait for outside enforcement to say, you know, this is, a, this is a great technology that can help improve our lives, we may be waiting a while. It's up to us to kind of adopt it and like push forward the idea and find the potentials of it. Um, the other one is the printing press, Janus uh, Gutenberg. This revolutionized the world. This allowed people to share ideas. The scientific community suddenly was able to shared discoveries around all the world. Um, they were able to bring forth a new concept of information that otherwise wouldn't have existed. Um, this again shows another example of how technology, how people thinking coming together can really revolutionize the way we view the world. So current issues. I like to give out some facts. Um, this for me is a great way of putting forth the idea of why we need the blockchain, why we need transparency, why we need the security that Bitcoin and its blockchain, the trailing blockchain, allows us to bring forth. So, facts. We know Goldman Sachs helped Greece get into the EU by cooking books. One. Two. Deutsche Bank owns over $2 trillion in debt. Deutsche Bank recently was part of a um, couple of other Western organizations that laundered money for Russian criminals. Um, these are so-called uh, regulated institutions. So for me, it's funny to see this because a lot of times people refer to Bitcoin and say, oh, but it's not regulated, we must regulate it. Yet here are key examples of leading banks and institutions from the UK and Western world who, despite being regulated, 
are helping transfer up to $20 billion in London money. For me, this is very interesting. Other key examples, Yahoo, 500 million emails were put forth in 2016 of people's private credentials, names, date of birth, etc. In 2013, this number was 1 billion. Other examples, IRS in America, responsible for holding people's very, very personal data. 720,000 accounts were released. Dropbox, 68 million accounts were released. LinkedIn, 117 million accounts were released. This is my data, your data, people's at home's data. This is very valuable information that I don't want in the public domain. I mean, there's a website right now that you can go and check based on your email address where your email has been leaked. Mine, to my surprise, was only leaked once, and it was my previous email, thank God. Um, I asked my friend to check his, and his has been leaked five times. One was through LinkedIn, one was through another organization and such. And you can go check and see where your email has been leaked and put forth. A recent bill came about a couple of days ago that allowed ISPs in the United States to sell your browsing history. And this is again our private information. And uh, what example does this set? What example does this set on the global scale? So, hack sites have been increased by 32% in 2016, one third. And you've got to understand, organizations such as Facebook, Google, these big entities would not exist, would not have the power they had without our support without the data we provide them. Facebook would be nothing without the content that we put on there. So why should our content not be encrypted? Why shouldn't it be, why don't we get any benefit from it? Meanwhile, the key members of those companies go up in ranks and wealth. So Bitcoin changes this whole paradigm and goes, hold on a sec, if you're giving us content that we are making ourselves um, more legit for and more uh, recognizable for, you should too, you too should be rewarded for it. So a key example is storage. Storage came about in 2014, and since then they have come to compete with uh, existing cloud storage institutions. And what's really beautiful about this is that they allow uh, your, private, uh, your empty space on your hard drive to be used in a way that allows other individuals to use that space to store files and things like that. And they can compete with Dropbox, they can compete with Amazon S3 servers, they can compete with massive organizations that exist today. And this is very, very interesting. Because if you look at the model, it's similar to Airbnb saying, hold on, not everyone uses every single room in their house. You might have an empty house. Why don't you rent it out and get some money for it? So the similar concept is like, I don't use all the space on my hard drive, especially in today's day where everyone backs everything to the cloud. Why don't you spur that out and allow us to hand that out to companies to have a very secure, very quick, and very uh, cost-effective means of sharing data. So if you compare the amount of data that we can provide compared to a centralized organization, I mean, it's just uncomparable. And what this allows to do is that we no longer have hacks where your private information is released. If you were to hack a Dropbox, I mean, storage, you wouldn't be able to find anything. It would just be encrypted data that you wouldn't be able to find any personal information with it. So this already tackles the idea of centralization. It allows data to be stored between all the people. And it's a marvelous uh, improvement on the existing uh, system, the schematics. All right, so you can either see the difference between centralized institutions and decentralized institutions. I mean, it's not an attack on the central uh, entities. You can use these systems to improve your systems for the people. If that is your goal, which should be. If you're holding people's private data, you should do your best to secure that data. I mean, a company as big as Yahoo, having one billion emails leaked, that's a joke. How is that even possible? Moving forward. These are just kind of the prog progression of uh, storage over the years. You know, they, they've done really well and they just came out with the public release. That, so you can actually use this. You can use this setup in your company, you can use it at home if you just know a few lines of code. The other example I want to get to is BitNation. So where does BitNation come into all of this? So first of all, we can use things like IPFS um, and storage to store people's credentials. Um, I was in a meeting in uh, Den Haag with IDNX as well, and a representative from the UK government was there, and he said, oh, we're passing out people's information to the banks. And I thought this was a terrible idea because now you hold people's money, transactions, daily spendings, daily uh, purchasing habits, and you want to pass on people's credentials to them as well. What? allows you to do that? Who allows you to make such a decision? I thought it was a terrible move. But why not encrypt it all into the blockchain when no one owns it? If anyone attacks it, 
you're just not going to be able to find anything. So using these methods, you can reanalyze and reestablish the concept of governance. Furthermore, allowing people to create their own governance based on what they believe is to be true. I mean, if you look at a country like Switzerland, which is broken out to individual states, but yet they act as a nation, I find this common sense, like that's how it should work, right? Why should a country be governed by the same rules that may not apply to the north that speaks a different language to the south, which may have different culture? Why don't they have the ability to kind of bend the rules based on what they need? It doesn't have to be completely different. It doesn't have to be off the grid or anarchist or anything like that, but allow them the freedom to deal with their own culture and their own means of living by what they believe to be true. So we created this. We allow people to create their own nation. It's a very beta kind of a stage. You know, we're trying to put the idea out there. But just imagine the seed that's planted into people's minds. We have over 6,000 people around the globe, every single continent, apart from Antarctica, filled by people who are keen to see this idea grow. People who want to see a difference. They want to see how they can govern themselves based on their own ideologies. I mean, the simple matter is, it's unnatural. It's unnatural to have millions of people follow the same rules. What's good for me is not good for you, and what's good for you may not be good for me. And this concept is very prevalent in today's day and age. What's further, what's more interesting is that today's laws don't apply to today's world. I mean, the bureaucracy and the laws that were established, they're good, they got us here, but it's time we establish new ones. It's time that we look outside and see what else we can do. You know, does the laws today match the technology provided Maybe, maybe not. Can we improve it? Can we do something better? Can we abandon some of these rules that are holding us back and move on to a better time? These are very interesting questions to ask, and the answer is, well, you can have a think for yourself. Two billion people on the planet don't have access to modern banking facilities. Two billion people. There's seven point something billion people. You know, that's an enormous number of people. Imagine they suddenly have access to banking to be able to do business, to be able to communicate, to be able to create an e-commerce system to be able to feed themselves and enter the market like everyone else. Imagine the change this could have on third world countries. A ten trillion dollar economy, the second largest after the US economy. I think these are really good ideas. We recently won an award from Next, uh, Nextflow uh, Forum, uh, which will be given to us on April 27th. And this was for our refugee program, for our ability to kind of, during the crisis, come up with a new idea, like, oh, why don't we use, you know, Bitcoin blockchain-based uh, advancements and provide people with a different, different method of approach. You know, meanwhile, the governments are trying to figure out whether we should give them IDs, which they will need to create bank accounts. They will need to have money. What are we giving them debit cards? Bitcoin debit cards, for that matter, that anyone from anywhere in the world can top up for them, without the fees, without Western Union asking for IDs. And you may think, oh, what about, you know, money laundering and all this other stuff that may be affected. We need people's uh, know your customer kind of a concept. And that exists too. It's not, a, it's not a legal matter. And you're allowed to have that up to a thousand euro limit. Imagine a refugee without money. A thousand euros is a large amount of money that could help them. And we already saw what regulated institutions already had to do. So, you know, you've got to take that into account too. Furthermore, this allows people to free themselves without needing. They can go and work, and they can be paid in Bitcoin. And they can go to an ATM and pull that money out, wherever Visa or the MasterCard is accepted, without needing to wait around you know, in, the, in the terrible places and bureaucracy that they face. Moving outside, outside the blockchain, what else is happening? Um, what else can we do? Outside the blockchain, there are meshing networks. <coughs> I mean, if you compare decentralized and centralization on a, a software level, you already see the tremendous difference. I mean, if you got Linux, which is open source, handled by engineers all around the world, I can go and make a change to it. They don't ask, hey, what's your background? Apply for a resume, then we'll accept your changes. No, if my change is good enough, it will be submitted. And that's the end of it. So that's, that's a big, big difference. And then you've got Windows, which is closed source, you know, being controlled. iOS, the same thing. And you can see where Linux is being used, and it speaks for itself. I don't need to you know, convince anyone. Every Android phone in here is based on Linux. Decentralized internet, can we do this? Yes, we can. Meshing networks exist in areas um, in Greece, Argentina, um, Spain. All these places are kind of taking this, and they like it because it allows them to have an internet connection that is spread around the community. It doesn't rely on ISPs. It doesn't get monitored like ISPs. You can have your own private <coughs> network within a city where you can share files. People have gotten 
relationships, marriages, and things like that out of machine net waste because it brings people to, closer together. You're dealing with communities that you know. What about in parts of the world that they can't afford an internet connection individually? What if we have a meshing network that gets fed by wine or internet connection, by everyone in that community chipping together and affording that and be able to share that with everyone around them? Wouldn't that be nice? They already are doing that. So, meshing with the traditional internet, you can see the benefits. You can see how it can improve lives, it can improve individuality, as well as collectivity. So the whole concept is, um, it's not an attack on existing institutions. Everything is going well, but it can be done a lot better. Our current laws don't match it. You know, we have people who can be helped out much better by peer-to-peer -peer networks. And, you know, you have institutions even in the Netherlands where, you know, you invite a refugee over for dinner. You have to get to know them, see what their lives are like. Maybe you'll get informed, maybe you'll teach them something. There are lots of programs that are being done by individuals rather than government. I mean, we're seeing a shift from centralized entities to people helping out people. And I think this is much more natural order of things. It's not by surprise that the Netherlands is the number one supporter of Bitcoin in all of Europe, second after Silicon Valley. Because it matches the golden age, it matches the trading, it matches the concept of liberty, it matches the concept of how life should be. You deal with each other and you make a deal peer to peer. That for me is remarkable. That for me is how things should be. What I do with someone else, as long as I'm not hurting anyone else, as long as I'm not doing anything illegal, should be no one else's business. And if they're happy, I'm happy, why should anyone intervene? Why should they come in the middle and take fees from me for things that they don't need to? So it's all about removing the middle, man, allowing progress to speed it up and become cleaner, more versatile, quicker, more secure, safer, and privacy enhanced by levels that we don't even have yet. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Any questions? It was clear, I think.